It was back in 2013, in August, or a little less than a year ago, that uh, there was a video posted of a Marine Corps colonel who's also an advisor to the Army, a veteran of the Iraq Wars, you name it, speaking out at a city council, warning them that military equipment and training was being prepositioned around the country by Homeland Security, and that it was pointed at the American people. Well, in the last year since he talked about that, we have seen thousands of headlines, literally dozens a week, like this one from the London Guardian, Pentagon preparing for mass civil unrest, social breakdown. Here's another one. The cost of the American police state. Battlefield USA, trillions in the last 20 years spent building up this giant domestic apparatus, hundreds of billions just the last five years. It is simply incredible. That's from the ACLU study. So we're really honored today to have Pete Martino in studio with us for this special report. We appreciate his courage because obviously the establishment has criticized him for talking about the 10 trillion pound elephant in the living room or the fact that the emperor is not wearing any clothes. Uh, he is a retired colonel in the uh, U.S. Uh, Marine Corps Reserves now. He's commanded an infantry platoon, company, and battalion, and has been the senior U.S. advisor to an Iraqi army brigade. And he got a bronze star for some of the operations he was involved in in Numania, Iraq. So after more than 10 months of trying to get him in studio, we've got Colonel Martino right here with us. Colonel, great to have you here with us. Thanks, Alex. Just call me Pete. I'm a civilian now. Uh, well, one of the things I'd like to say... Uh, first off, is I had a very highly educated Iraqi tell me one time that the way to solve the IED problem over there was the first time you have an attack, take a look around, find the closest house, go knock on the door, tell those folks you got one hour to pack and get out and then blow up their house. And the logic there is next time pay attention to what goes on in front of your house. And I think that's the mindset in a lot of the world. And one of the messages I think that should come out of that to the American people is the reason so many people in the world want to kill us is because we need to pay attention on what's going on in our own house. And when it comes to these bear cats and this issue, to be honest with you, I really don't have a problem with the police having bear cats. If it's to keep me safe and to keep police officers safe. Uh, in fact, I know about a dozen police officers personally in New Hampshire who, if they were the ones holding the key, they could park it in my driveway and I'd sleep better at night. But the reality is, I don't know all the people who have the keys to those bear cats. And the thing that concerned me in Concord last year was that the chief of police justified on his grant application for that bear cat as one of the reasons was to deal with the daily challenges of the Free State Project. Now, the Free State Project is just a, a group of uh, liberty-minded individuals, activists, who are trying to get 20,000 people, activists, to move to New Hampshire because it's a small state, and try to restore liberty there and return to constitutional government. Uh, about a dozen of them are already uh, state representatives there. And they're saying we need armored vehicles uh, that have been used in Iraq because of the Free State Project peacefully and politically. There symbols the porcupine, doesn't attack anybody, but it'll defend itself, want to try to vote for more freedom, so we need armored vehicles. Exactly. And I think some of them are a little bit out there as far as some of their tactics. Uh, I know some of them are out there maybe ticking off a lot of the police, and I think they should knock it off because it's not the police that are really the problem. It's, it's some of the leadership, and it's the laws themselves. Uh, one of the Free State Project members actually uh, reminded everybody that New Hampshire has an open carry law. And he reminded everybody by walking down the street in Manchester, New Hampshire, downtown, and was stopped by the police and detained for a while until finally people realized that it's not an illegal act to walk down the street open carrying. And since then, now you can see people open carrying. So if we don't remind people of our freedoms, people forget we have them. And I agree. That's the cutting edge of the true civil rights movement is open carry and things like that because a right not exercised is dead. But Colonel, I wanna go back uh, to that city council meeting and play a few clips right now. What's happening here is we're building a domestic military because it's unlawful or unconstitutional to use American troops on American soil. So what we're doing is we're building a military. My best friend who's a SWAT officer in Nashua who came to Iraq with me to train the Iraqi police 
sent me an email with a picture of him in the media on the streets of Watertown, Mass, wearing the exact same combat gear that we had in Iraq, only it was a different color. And what, the way we do things in the military is called task organization. You take a command, and then you attach units to it in order to accomplish the mission. What's happening is Homeland Security is pre-staging gear, equipment, consistent. And so what we're doing here, and let's not kid about it, we're building a domestic army and we're shrinking the military because the government is afraid of its own citizens. We're building an army over here, and I can't believe that people aren't seeing it. Is everybody blind? That's all. I'll take that. understand, though, your point about not blaming the police individually or the military individually. I found police and military are some of the most awake, pro-liberty people out there because they know what's going on on the inside. But undoubtedly now, they say that Homeland Security is not for Al-Qaeda that you fought in Iraq. It's for the Tea Party, for veterans, for gun owners. That's in the news. Mm -hmm. And that it's for domestic groups and civil unrest. Uh, that's unconstitutional under posse commentatus. Well, I think one of the reasons that I have concerns about Homeland Security, as I said, it comes down to trust. And one of the things that doesn't instill trust in me is the chief, the chief of staff of Homeland Security was actually turned state witness and testified against his father-in-law, uh, who was a state senator in Pennsylvania. And he was charged and went to prison for 137 counts of corruption. And the, uh, I think, it, what's his name, um, Christian Marone, who's the, now the chief of staff of Homeland Security, uh, worked for the senator, spent 80 percent of his time doing personal work for the senator, particularly overseeing construction projects on the senator's house. And a Philadelphia city councilman said that he basically turned over on his father-in-law to keep himself from going to jail. So these are imperfect people that are in the system. That's why you've got to put restraints on it checks and balances and we're all imperfect and that's the scary part how much power do we want to give people who are imperfect especially someone like this who used as justification well it was you know the culture of philadelphia politics so exactly i mean w we didn't have military on the streets before in america because we understood that always turned bad why is it happening now and we're not talking about during riots just roll them out, have them out there. Talk about why you originally went to the city council and warned people. And then I want to get your take on the NSA, on the IRS, because you've got an incredible list of things to talk about, Colonel. Well, thanks. Uh, the thing that actually brought me to that city council meeting was one of my sons. Uh, one of his friends uh, was a victim of uh, police uh, abuse. And in some of these uh, police departments all over the country, but even in New Hampshire and some of these small towns, you get some bad apples. And the problem is that those bad apples, like in any industry, any organization, any bureaucracy, whether it's the IRS, the NSA, and so on, you've got these people who abuse their power. And so when people are victimized by people in power, it's a lot different than when somebody robbing you to take your wallet. These people have power and the authority of government behind them. And so I think institutions need to take a little bit of pride in, and step up themselves and police their own. And I'm shocked that nobody at the IRS has come forward. Somebody sat next to Lois Lerner. Somebody in some of these agencies was in the next cubicle and knew what was going on and still knows what's going on. And yet you don't see people coming forward and talking about it. So when you work for a government agency and people start broad brushing that agency and talking about it, they're talking about you. Same thing with our country. When people say, negative things about the United States or they want to kill us or whatever, they're talking about you and me. The United States isn't some piece of dirt. It's not some monument, some building. It's you and me. It's, it's us. People. It's we the people. And that's why I do what I do. So I don't want it in my name. Exactly. And so where are the people in these agencies? You know, the, where's the embarrassment? Where's the shame? Where's the, the sense of conscience to go out there and speak up and say something? And a lot of people are afraid of retaliation or losing their job. Well, go get another job. Look for one beforehand. Look for other Well, I found historically, but also personally, we're going to lose everything if we don't standing, start standing up for what that's right. This attitude of just go along, don't make waves is going to cause a literal tsunami of tyranny to bring it all down. And it, it all boils down to integrity. And that's one of the things that scares me, too, is the director of Homeland Security said that he was impressed with the, his new chief of staff's integrity. And so 
when we talk about integrity, I don't know what their definition is, but uh, you know, I, I thought it was interesting. You know, we talk about the integrity of the Department of Homeland Security. You know, here we are being told that the NSA needs to turn the whole planet into the Truman Show, and we're all Truman. And yet, at the same time, we've got people walking across the border. You know without any ID, just being shipped all over the country. Borders wide open, yeah. but Homeland Security is for veterans, Tea Party, gun owners, libertarians. Just like you said a year ago, why are, why are the armored vehicles for the Peaceful Free State Project? Exactly. It's a fraud. It's domestically being pointed at us, so we need to have a national debate about it and explain, hey, you better point that somewhere else. And what it comes down to is the integrity of an organization by looking at its mission statement. And... This is the part that I think is wrong with this country is we've got all these lofty mission statements in all of our institutions. And yet, if you look at the, at the mission statement and try to um, follow that mission statement, you end up in trouble with your supervisors. You know, right from the Department of Homeland Security's website, there are five core missions. Prevent terrorism and enhancing security. Secure and manage our borders. Enforce and administer our immigration laws. Safeguard and secure cyberspace. Ensure resilience to disasters. Now, they're acting contrary to at least three of those core mission statements. And so... You know, I'd like to challenge all those, you know, border folks down there. I know there's some good people down there who are trying to speak up, but, you know, people need to band together and, and stand up and start doing what's right. Point to your mission statement. If you're being told to do something that's contrary to that, you need to go up the chain of command until you find somebody who's willing to do something about it. I saw an article just a few days ago in Reuters about them giving an award uh, nationally to all the people in Operation Valkyrie that tried to kill Hitler. And they teach in the German military now, if somebody tells you to do something illegal or to violate people's rights, it's not a right, it's a duty to resist it. Well, that was taught in the past in our military manuals. I've seen the ones up until the 70s. I don't see that being taught now. Exactly. I was in the Budapest airport one time and I saw a display for cigarettes for sale and they had multiple warning signs, you know, labels uh, in multiple languages. And one of them, the one in English said, this product will kill you. I love that. Straight to the point, honest. Wouldn't it be nice if our politicians and our government agencies came with those same warning labels instead of the lofty ones that we come up with that are hypocritical? Well, you get called an extremist for saying out-of-control government will kill you. George Washington basically said that. And they call that terrorism now. Yeah, they're terrorists, but the bottom line is to them, they are not. Now, why is that important to understand? Because they are as committed to their cause and to their way of life as you are yours. And they see you as being wrong. Who was the first terrorist organization in the United States? <clears throat> Who? Founding Fathers. Founding Fathers. You mean Thomas Jefferson? Oh, yeah. You mean uh, George Washington? Oh, yeah. Paul Revere? Yeah. These guys right here, let me ask you something. Did they try to scare people? <laughs> oh, yeah. They tried to intimidate the British. Did they try to, did they use acts of violence? Your founding fathers, my founding fathers, were involved in acts of terrorism against British officials because they systematically had British officials assassinated. I mean, that is scary when the government is saying, criticizing us and promoting what the country's founded on is extremist and connected to terrorism. Yeah. Well, here's another great mission statement, and this is right out of the uh, VA's website. Uh, VA's five core values underscore the obligations inherent in VA's mission. Integrity, commitment, advocacy, respect, and excellence. The core values define who we are, our culture, and how we care for veterans. Taking the first letter of each word, integrity, commitment, advocacy, respect, and excellence, creates a powerful acronym, I CARE. Come on. Why aren't people in prison right now? If anybody gave a damn that we've got over a 1,000 veterans died because of being ignored secret death list yeah and so meanwhile though the president seems to know more about the health care of a prisoner of war on the other side of the country or on the other side of the world who's been accused of being a deserter and he couldn't notify congress and give him the 30-day notice that by law the law that he signed he was obligated to do released five 
known terrorists from Guantanamo Bay, which arguably could be treason because it's aiding and abetting the enemy to get this one soldier back. And he couldn't tell anybody about it in Congress because the hell, his health was in such dire need. There was Now he's well, back on regular duty. You know, he would probably had better health care while he was a prisoner of war. He's still alive five years later. We've got veterans who can't say the same thing. Well, well Joe Biggs right here in this office coughs up blood every night. He was blown up multiple times in armored vehicles. And he literally... They keep sending him to other meetings. They keep, and then the illegals come across, God bless them. They get free health care, but our veterans have had it turned off. Why do you think the system's doing that? Well, I think that it comes down to we've got corruption at the highest levels of all of our institutions. And that's, that's I think, the, the main point to get across. If you look at most of our institutions in this country, you've got people at the, the front lines who are honest, have integrity, they're, they're doing their job, they're, they're trying to live the mission statement. The VA has some of the most salt-of-the-earth people working there, the ones who are actually providing the, the care. But when you look at these corrupt bureaucrats who are making money on the blood of veterans by earning bonuses, by trying to falsify records to show what great care they're giving everybody. You know, somebody needs to send these people to prison, and it's just like blowing up the person's house. Next time, pay attention. It sends a message to everybody else in the neighborhood. Pay attention. If you punish somebody like a, a Lois Lerner or, or some of these folks, these bureaucrats and these other agencies that we know are corrupt, it would send a message to the rest of them. But that, that's the problem, and I think that until people in these organizations either band together or stand up and do like the uh, Department of Homeland Security tells us all to do. You see something, say something. Of course, they don't want you to say something about the corruption you're finding in government, and they're more concerned about investigating those people who do speak out than what they're speaking out against. And well, I, I tell you, Colonel, I agree, and the answer is all of us start speaking out. That's why you were saying before you went on air, look, I'm not a hero. Don't talk about my bronze star, blah, blah, blah. But the point is, in a world of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. George Arwell, <laughs> you are a hero, and everybody inside the system that speaks out, and I know you've had some repercussions for speaking out, you are a hero. Because studies show that political valor, uh, going up against peer pressure in the establishment, is more rare than physical valor. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. I think you're a hero. In fact, you know, I, one of the things I hear a lot, people, when they see a veteran, they'll say, oh, thank you for your service. I want to thank you for your service. Oh, well, thank you. And well, I'm just trying to have a f free country for my kids. Exactly. And that's what I want to do is try and turn over, you know, something to my kids that was turned over to me from my father and mother's job. Absolutely. It's an imperative uh, that, that instinctively we stand against this. I mean, is that how you feel? It's just like a burning desire? Yeah, I, f I feel like the thing that, that scares me about this country is the same thing that scares uh, Mike Mullen, uh, Admiral Mullen, who was a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. This is, was the most senior man in uniform in our country who said the, the most significant threat to this country isn't terrorism, it's our debt. Raising the debt ceiling, which has done, been done over 100 times, does not increase our debt. It does not uh, somehow promote profligacy. All it does is it says, you got to pay the bills that you've already racked up, Congress. When our country collapses, what do people think is going to happen economically? I thought it was interesting that during the last government shutdown that they had a, a quote-unquote glitch in the EBT card system where in about a dozen states, and I'm sure you remember it, it caused havoc. It caused havoc because people's EBT cards didn't work. And a lot of Walmarts across the country, you know, had some sure. serious problems. And I think that was to send a message to the people who did not want to sign uh, that law to, to raise the, the debt ceiling. And it was, do you really want this to happen on your watch? Because this is what happens when people's EBT cards don't work for a few hours. What do you think is going to happen when Social Security recipients, people on disability, veterans, people, everybody who works for a government agency suddenly doesn't get their check? What's a people? We're going to need those bear cats. And, and that's really, you know, I don't have a problem with having bear cats because if they're going to collapse the government and you're going to see riots in the streets if our if our economy collapses then sure people are going to be wishing they had more bear cats but the well well that's where i was going and i want to hear who's controlling those bear cats who are the people at the top that are going to be giving those orders and we know it's going to be at the tea party who knew about the problems and tried to stop it 
It's going to be the free staters who knew about the problems and tried to stop it. And, 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 and that's the issue is that I've said as things collapse and, and if Austin's burning, you know, where we're talking today, I would want the police to put down riots and protect my house. The issue is, though, the globalists lit the fuse of this. The Federal Reserve devalued the dollar. They moved the world away from the dollar. They did this, and they think they're going to bring in the crisis and get total social control out of it. Mm -hmm. They engineered it. Mm -hmm. So when it all collapses, mm -hmm. which probably is inevitable now, probably too late to reverse it. Ron Paul said that on my show, and I agree with him. Mm -hmm. We tried years ago. Mm -hmm. The people that engineered this need to get the blame and go to prison so it doesn't happen again. Instead, we're going to end up with the engineers of this, who certainly exacerbated it, getting more power out of the crisis they created. You know, the old days, if you screwed up, you got fired or in trouble. Now they insulate themselves. So, so what I want to do, sir, because you're respectful and a nice guy, you keep throwing it back to me. I want to give you the floor now here for about 15, 20 minutes to get into all these incredible points that you bring up about the average Marine corporal. How much power do you want the president to have in the centralization of control? Uh, government as a racket, Smedley Butler, Noam Chomsky. Uh, I want to give you the floor here to address the viewers out there, Colonel, and, and, and really talk to folks. Because I think in the final equation, what you're getting at here is this is all a discussion we got to have with ourselves, our families, everybody else. This is a societal evolution. We're going into the bottom of a decadence cycle. And if good men and women don't get on deck to try to really have a soft landing, uh, who knows where the world is going. So, so I want to give you the floor here to basically do 10, 15 minute, 20 minute speech, whatever you want to the viewers out there and the listeners out there. Going back to the integrity issue, here's another mission statement from our IRS. Provide American taxpayer, America's taxpayers top quality service by helping them understand and meet their tax responsibilities and force the law with integrity and fairness to all. So when it comes to what does integrity look like, if you look at our leadership, it, it, it's really uh, shameful. It, uh, you know, our, our people deserve better than that. Our, our veterans deserve, deserve better than that. Our citizens deserve better than that. Uh, We've had wars on poverty, drugs, the, the war on terrorism, and we're losing all of them. Uh, but we never see a war on corruption, a war on abuse of power, and a war on ignorance. Not illiteracy, but ignorance about what really goes on in this country. And I think, Alex, you do a great job of really, you've, you've hit it right on the head, info wars. It's all about controlling information. And, you know, people just don't get the facts. They don't get the information. They don't really know what's going on out there. And so I think that a, a war on ignorance is about teaching people, you know, how vulnerable they really are toward mind control, manipulation, and so on. I, I read years ago that there was actually a psychology professor, of all people, whose class decided to do an experiment on him. And when he moved to the left side of the classroom, they all perked up and looked interested. When he moved to the right side of the classroom, they all looked bored and falling, nodding off. And by the end of a few classes, he was teaching the entire class leaning against the left side of the, the wall on the left side of the classroom. And when the this is the interesting part, though. When the students told him that they had manipulated him and that they put him there, he outright refused to believe it. He said that, no, I just like it over here better. And I think that's what's going on in this country. And the real, um, the cure for, or the way to inoculate people against manipulation, against mind control, against influence, is to simply educate them about the process of how it's done. And, and the real key is to get people to be willing to listen to other sides of an issue and stop being convinced that there are only two sides. Uh, the government obviously keeps everybody fighting against each other over distraction issues like abortion, uh, gay rights, you name it. Uh, if everybody could just take a break for one election cycle, all these one-issue voters out there, and just make the one-issue corruption, and regardless of where your politicians stand on your particular issue, you know, if you can't trust them, then why are they your poster child? Why would you want to send somebody to Washington who is lied to your face? If you were 
an employer and an employee lied to you, stole from you, how long would they last? If you had a neighborhood watch, would you give all the weapons to the one person in the neighborhood who lies to everybody who you can't trust, who's actually stolen from people? And so that, that's one of the things that concerns me. And I think it's really that war on ignorance and really reminding people or educating people as to just how much corruption has gone on in this country. Uh, one of the solutions, I think, uh, to fight the, this war on corruption, and, and I see all the time out there on the Internet, there's a lot of people out there who talk about taking up arms against the government and, you know, starting a new revolution. Well, you know, I don't think we're ready for that yet. I don't think that that's the way to do it. I think that the war really needs to be about corruption. And the way I would fight a war nowadays, if I were to go uh, try and take over a country, I wouldn't send battalions of troops over. I'd send battalions of students, journalists, business people, politicians, teachers, and so on. And I would have them go into all those organizations within that country. And it really comes down to a battle of ideas over the water cooler, have discussions, let the best ideas rise to the top. And, and really it's about, it's about educating people. It's about doing the right thing. And I think that if people uh, really want to fight for this country, if you work for a government agency, you need to step up and you need to look around, read your mission statement. If you're acting in conflict to that, then do something about it. If, if you're told not to, then go to your supervisor, go to your supervisor's supervisor. Until the time comes when enough people band together to turn some of these agencies around and we start demanding that people be held accountable. Uh, one of the things that uh, bothers me about abuse of power is it causes so much damage. When you kill or abuse one innocent person, it creates 10 new enemies. And I think that's what we do with this global war on terrorism. I think that's what we do with a lot of our police departments out there. You know, you always have that 10% in any organization that we talk about as, you know, the ones that are the problem children. But the reality is a lot of times it's more than 10%. And in our government agencies, you know, that other 90% needs to, you know, clean up their, their house. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of times I think that 10% is at the top, so it's going to be hard. Another thing that I think might be uh, a small first step is wouldn't it be nice if somebody would sponsor a bill and we passed a law to add the oath to tell the truth to the oath of office? And what that would mean is... Basically, any time a politician or a government bureaucrat who, who takes an oath of office is speaking publicly or representing their office, whether it's to the people or the, the media, that they're under oath and that they're subject to the laws of perjury, subject to the penalty of perjury. And why don't we have mandatory sentences? And so I think if we could just clean up our politicians and bureaucrats, it's a small step because you know they'd, I'm sure they'd work around uh, – you know, lying to us, maybe they'd just shut up, which wouldn't be a bad thing either. I'd rather have them not say anything than to just lie to us. Uh, but eventually, organizations, whether it's a military organization or unit, a company, a corporation, a bureaucracy, or a country, eventually, organizations take on the qualities and characteristics of their leaders. There's an old saying that an army of deer led by a lion is more to be feared than an army of lions led by a deer. And if you look at the people who are leading us, where are they taking us? When you look at some of the qualities of our leaders, we need to take a closer look of who's representing you. These are the people who represent us around the world. The, we had a, an ambassador to Belgium who was an accused pedophile. And the, I, there was a, an internal memo that was found or became public a while back that said that Howard Gutman would frequently try to ditch his security detail and solicit sex from prostitutes and minor children. And yet the investigation into that was quashed by high-level members in the State Department. Secretary of Clint State Clinton at the time said that the first she heard about it was in the media. Now, my question is, okay, well, once you did finally hear about it, what did you do about it? Doesn't it concern anybody that the one person who's representing the entire United States to the people of Belgium could be molesting their kids? Mr. President, you're telling me that that's the best person you could find to be an ambassador for us, to represent us? Jeffrey Tubin said that Gutman was a Washington super lawyer who bought his ambassadorship through massive contributions to the Obama campaign. 
And Mr. President, you couldn't find a secretary of state out of all the qualified people in this country who wouldn't have to read it in the newspaper that one of our ambassadors could be a child molester. Another thing that, that I'm curious about is you know, these, these ambassadors that are political appointees, it's interesting that they never seem to end up in places like Benghazi or things like that. And if they did, I wonder if we'd spend more money to protect them or, or, or maybe make more of an effort to protect them if they were in danger. What difference at this point does it make? It continues to come back to trust. And if you look at our politicians, you can go all the way back or as far back as you want to look at lies that have been told to the American public. And, you know, Herbert Hoover said that the economy was great and everything was wonderful. And a week later, the, uh, the stock market crashed and we entered the Great Depression. Uh, President Kennedy said that we weren't conducting any type of, you know, operations or anything against Cuba. The next day, an American pilot was shot down over Cuba. President Johnson lied to us about the Gulf of Tonkin incident, and that was highly classified. It was only recently that top secret documents were released that confirmed what a lot of people knew, and that was that the Gulf of Tonkin incident was a lie, and it was just used to justify going to war in Vietnam. And how many thousands of people died over that war? If somebody at the time had informed people about that, that would have been a violation of their top secret clearance and they'd be in a prison cell today or maybe sharing a room in Russia with Edward Snowden. We've also had uh, Ronald Reagan who said we did not trade arms for hostages. Uh, Bill Clinton, I did not have sex with that, with that woman. And for those who say that, you know, a politician's sex life shouldn't matter, I agree to a point. But the problem is, if he was willing to, if President Clinton was willing to lie to his own cabinet, to the entire country about his sexual relationships that he did not want made public, what else would he have done if some one of our enemies found out about that? And maybe they did, who knows? But how much pressure could those people put on him to do things? If, if you're trying to hide something like that, look at all of our politicians out there who may have some of these skeletons in their closet. And so... Lies are lies. When you look at uh, President Bush, I will not read my lips. No new taxes. Read my lips. No new taxes. We also heard from his son about weapons of mass destruction. Those weapons of mass destruction got to be somewhere. <laughs> President Obama, you can keep your insurance. You can keep your doctor. Uh, Noam Chomsky said, once said that the reason that a lot of governments classify information isn't necessarily to keep it from their enemies, who in many cases already know, but it's to keep it from their own people. General Smedley Butler, the only Marine to, wear, to, to be awarded the Medal of Honor twice, wrote a book, War is a Racket, and I know you're familiar with it, Alex, but uh, after World War I, Smedley Butler did some research and found that th that war created over 21,000 billionaires and millionaires during a time when the frontline troops were pay being paid $30 a month. And he said that the, the, the key to ending war would be simple, take the profit out of it. He said, if you conscripted labor, capital, anything that's needed for the war effort and paid CEOs, politicians, generals, admirals, everybody on down, the same thing that the private fighting the war is being paid, announced that 30 days ahead of time, and he said there'll be no war. And it's curious, I'd be curious to see how long the war on terrorism would last if CEOs of some of these defense contractors, private security companies, were making $1,500 $1, a month instead of eight-figure salaries in some cases. And that's another concern, is the, the privatization of the military. What we're seeing is that in the past, a lot of these government contractors in the military-industrial complex provided materials and equipment to fight our wars. Huge profiteering was taking place. But nowadays, we're not only these companies are providing materials to fight the wars, but people themselves. A lot of our support troops are slowly being replaced by private contractors, people from other countries, even third world countries in some cases. And so these, these folks are actually out there on the battlefield. If you look at what happened in Fallujah, the whole thing that sparked that, if it wasn't for four Blackwater employees getting killed and dragged through the streets of Fallujah, nobody would have ever even heard of that city. 
and some of the questions to ask are, what were they doing there? Why weren't they adequately prepared? Even though the, the CEO of the company may have been making eight figures a year, what was the amount of that money that was trickling down to be able for these people to actually do their job safely? And I think the message that was being sent to the Iraqi people is, hey, those people need to get the same respect our military does. Don't mess with them or we're going to mess back. How many Marines were killed in that first battle of Fallujah, battle of Fallujah before the president pulled them out and then went back in uh, and, and fought a second battle over the same ground, only to lose the entire country now? to the very people we said we were going there to fight who weren't even there when we got there. I think if General Butler were alive today, he'd conclude that government is a racket. If you look at what's destroying this country, it's all the corruption. The reason we've got a $17 trillion debt is because of all the money that's been looted from our government, from the taxpayer, all the promises that were made to my parents' generation for Social Security and so on. You know, that money's been raided. That money's gone. You know, now that it's time to start paying those bills and to start paying those people what they were promised, that money's not there. And if there's one thing that has unified Democrats and Republicans and everybody in between, it's that we all hated the bank bailout. I think the question that people need to ask themselves is how much power and authority do you really want your leaders to have? And when the president of the United States claims the authority to be able to kill an American citizen anywhere in the world anytime just by declaring them a terrorist without any due process, that, that should concern people. And I think it concerns a lot of people, but apparently not enough to do anything about it. Um, when the, the most powerful person in the Senate calls a, an American citizen a terrorist, a domestic terrorist, like he did with Clive and Bundy, over a dispute about grazing fees, uh, an issue that's going on in, in courts, an issue that involves money and, and so on, and declares him a terrorist, you know, what message is he saying? I mean, he's basically telling the president of the United States, hey, here's one over here. Does that mean that the president is now going to, you know, send in a drone and kill Clive and Bundy or some other people? And so I think that's something that people need to pay attention to. If you think it's okay, for the President of the United States to be able to kill you, and you can sleep at night with that, then, hey, that's fine. But think about the crop of politicians here that are running for president. Think about the politicians in the opposite political party that you might belong to. You know, did you want George W. Bush to have the authority to kill you? Did you want uh, President Bill Clinton to have the power to kill you? Do you want President Obama to have the power to kill you? Do you want any of these candidates that are running for president to have the power to kill you? And that's something that everybody needs to take a real sobering look at. Do you really want your president to have the authority to kill you? Because that's what it comes down to. When you're saying, well, yeah, he can go kill a terrorist. Well, I'm not a terrorist, so I don't have anything to worry about. And it's just like the people say, well, if you don't have anything to hide, you shouldn't care or have anything to worry about that the NSA is monitoring every aspect of your life. And it's not that you have anything to hide. It's not that, you, that you're doing anything wrong. But the problem is, you know, people get the wrong message out of 1984. It's really about finding people's fears, finding people's weaknesses so they can be exploited. You know, maybe you're very close to a certain person or a certain relative. Maybe you didn't do anything wrong, but maybe they did. And now they can use that to get to you. And so... We shouldn't be under this level of surveillance. And it's total hypocrisy to try and tell the American people that we need this level of surveillance on our entire population because the threat is so significant. And yet at the same time, the very agency, the, the Department of Homeland Security, that's trying to put the fear into everybody, that's trying to terrorize the American people into believing that there's a terrorist around every corner and that your local police department needs to have an armored military vehicle in order to deal with it, when at the same time we've got people walking across our borders unchecked, not only unchecked, but assisted by our own government and being shipped all over the country. This is a biological attack. We've got diseases. We've got people who are literally walking biological weapons being sent all around the country. And if that's not uh, impeachable offenses, if, these, if this isn't even treason, then I'm not sure what is. You know, the, the average Marine corporal has more integrity, I think, than all of Washington. And they swore an oath to defend the Constitution, not the country, not the government, not even their families, but the Constitution, the ideas that are in there. If you're one of those people who always says 
to a, a veteran, hey, thank you for your service. If you want to thank a veteran, get a copy of the Constitution, read it. Help defend it here at home. Demand that your, your politicians uh, read the Constitution and start to live by it and vote by it. Uh, they deserve better. I think maybe that's why uh, the Homeland Security sees veterans as a threat, because they know what's in the Constitution. When I was a battalion commander, the very first thing I did was, was issue everybody in my battalion a copy of the Constitution, a pocket version, and told them to carry it with them all the time. I want to thank Colonel Pete Martino for doing what he's doing, standing up, being a man, fighting here in the Republic, here in the homeland against the takeover we see unfolding. And I want to talk to all of you out there. Remember that whether you are a Marine Corps colonel with a Bronze Star, whether you're a school teacher, whether you're an auto mechanic, black, white, old, young, Hispanic, I don't care. Muslim, Christian, Jew, agnostic. Liberty beats in the breast of every man and woman out there who's not evil. And most of us are not evil inherently. We just w are ignorant. And we've been afraid to stand up and be leaders. We're going to lose everything, ladies and gentlemen, if we don't stand up and speak out now and get back to the basic American values that made this country so great and made our nation the model of the world. So, Colonel, I salute you and your wife for coming to Austin to talk to us. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you, Alex. Pleasure. Anytime. All right, folks. Again, never forget, if you're watching or listening to this transmission, you are the resistance.